Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Pastor Don Weekly Podcast Show. I want to thank you so much for joining me, listening to my weekly devotional. As you now know, we are on iHeartRadio, Spotify, of course, we're on Spreaker, and we will be on YouTube and anywhere else on social media. Before I get started on my opening monologue, I want to again welcome my friend and brother in Christ, Donovan, to the show. How are you, Donovan? Doing great. It's supposed to rain today. I hope it does. Is uh, it supposed to rain today? They, they said 60%. Yeah, oh, wow. 60%. I didn't know that. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah, but I'm doing great. I'm doing great. You notice how I'm dressed? Yes. Got your ram uh, shirt. But see, you, uh, it, it should have been um, Eric Dickerson. I, I should have got you the Eric Dickerson. Oh, from Eric old Dickerson. School, in think, our, our era. You know, it's funny. I, I think I had an Eric Dickerson, but I gained some weight. It doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> right. But I have to have my Aaron Donald shirt because, right. in my opinion, the greatest offensive uh, performer uh, today. But. Uh, Anyways, I'm, I'm a huge Ram fan. I'm, I'm looking forward to the game. I want to be optimistic, but you know what? Going against Brady, it's kind of tough it's to be kinda, optimistic. Yeah. It's, it's kind of it's hard. It's hard. He's a legend. But anyways, it'll be a great game. All right, let me get started on my opening thoughts. You know, last week I started a new podcast series in looking at the right ways to be able to live righteously for God in 2019. And I discussed last week there are literally thousands upon thousands of choices that we make every day. Now, last week I shared the fact that we need to choose wisely in making decisions that would be pleasing to God. My second thought that I discussed last week was in order to make good choices in life, we have to realize that it's based on God's timing and not our own. Well, the person who said timing is everything only got it half right. Timing is not everything, but God's timing is everything. Psalms 27, 14 says this, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. It doesn't say to wait on your own accord. It doesn't say to do things at what you think is the timing's best. But we need to wait on God's perfect timing. In other words, we need to make choices in God's timing and not in our own. It is my opinion that it is through godly living and truly understanding God's plan that for each of us, and we need to understand what God, the spiritual gifts that God has blessed us with, so that we can be the man or woman, woman that God wants us to be. But we need to wait on God. It is His perfect timing for the important decisions in our life. I need you to be convinced in your mind and heart. If you are serious about making 2019 the most perfect, or not perfect, but the most productive year of your life, that you need to make the decision today that you are committed to growing in your faith. You know, last year, Donovan remembers, I did a podcast series about living in the end times. I am convinced 100% in my mind that there is no question we are living in the end times and the time is now to put our feet to the faith. But I need all of you listening and watching this podcast to also be convinced in your mind that the timing is now for God to be your number one priority and to live for Him. Folks, the timing is now to choose God over the things of this world. Folks, the timing is now to live each day as a reflection of Jesus. And finally, the timing is now to be a witness of the Word of God to our loved ones who may not have already surrendered their lives to Christ. Look what Jesus says to the disciples in John 4.35. I always thought this was interesting because this was right after he had that long discussion with the, the woman at the well. The disciples wanted Jesus to take out time from ministry and eat something. Well, that's interesting because, hey, when you're hungry, you got to have food. No problem. So the disciples went out and got food and brought it back to Jesus. But look what Jesus tells them in John 4, verse 35. He says, Do not say four more months and then the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for the harvest. In other words, what's the priority for Jesus at this time of his ministry? It's not feeding himself in regards to physical food for his physical body, but he saw the harvest. And he says, wait a minute, I'm only here for a short period of time. I have to go do the work of the Lord. Well, you know what, folks? In my opinion, the same is for you and me today. Look around our neighborhoods. Look around our communities, our city. Look around your sphere of influence. The fields are ready. It's ripe for harvest. Look at the news. The world is crumbling right before our eyes. And folks, God needs you and me to put him first 
and be actively involved in our faith in order to grow in our spiritual walk and be a witness to Him. Let me say it one last time. Timing is now. Tomorrow's too late. You agree with that, Donovan? Absolutely. Amen to that. Okay, lastly, after we make the decision that we have to make wise choices, then we realize, and we realize that we need to choose God first over anything else in the world, then we need to use our Bibles as our guide for important choices. We have the perfect blueprint in life, and so, ma so many times, me, including myself, we fail to utilize what God has given us in order to make these choices. Let me read to you from Psalm 1, verses 1 and 2. The very first two verses from the wonderful book of Psalm. It goes like this. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Everybody gets nervous when they hear the word meditate. Oh my gosh, when do I go into a little stance and, and meditate on? No, what it means is that you just don't read verses to say that you finished them, but you actually read into the verses and you try to understand how those verses can affect your life. Worldly things are not necessarily wicked. I'm not saying that everything we do is wicked or not worldly things is not always mocking God. But as I have aforementioned, you and I have many choices to make every day on things we need and the things that we want to do. And all I'm asking you to do is to choose the Bible as your guide to important decisions in life. Let me show you what I mean. About six years ago, a group of 500 men and women were asked the same questions. What are your most favorite things to do? Think about this one in your life, Donovan. Mm -hmm. Here was the result. What? Here's the question again. What are the, your most favorite things to do? Now, for the men, the number one thing that men enjoy doing more than anything else, I know you're going to laugh at this, in this poll was nothing. <laughs> number one for men, most important thing they do nothing. is nothing. In other words, we love to sit in our favorite chair, scratch ourselves, wa watching TV, listening to music, <laughs> and not thinking about anything. I know you and I, Donovan, I know what that's about. Because Linda asked me, my wife asked me every once in a while, are you in your nothing box? And I would say yes, and she knows, hey, I'm not going to be listening too much to you. Just leave me, tight, leave me alone. But there's other things men love doing based on this poll. Uh, in, on the week, during the week, or on weekends. Uh, they love to play video games. They love to watch or coach sports, which you do with your uh, nephew or in the basketball league. And they also like to go camping on the weekends, yes, I like that. watching TV movies, which I know you like to do it well, and also partying with their buddies. That's what men love to do. But guess what, guys? Number one, nothing. Wow, I did that. Women, <laughs> totally different. The number one thing that women enjoy doing on their weeknights or on their weekends is texting and talking to family. <laughs> I I'm believe surprised. that that is very true because ladies can spend hours upon hours doing that. Now, I, I'm, I'm a firm believer that men just can't do that. I, at least this man can. No. I'm not sure about you, Don. No, 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 absolutely not. I'll tell you this. Don, after about five, ten minutes, I've got nothing else to say. <laughs> right. And then Linda, my wife, could talk on the hour for three, four hours and basically say very little, but she enjoys that type of communication and camaraderie. So women are a little bit different in that ways. But women also love going to the beach, the park, or the spa. Women love to shop with friends, reading fashion or gossip magazines, and then getting a mani and a pedi. You're, not, you're gonna laugh at this, Don. <laughs> I didn't even know what that was. When I first read yeah. the poll, I said, what's a mani and a pedi? Mm -hmm. Not realizing it was short for manicure and pedicure. pedicure. And I, I was said, the same way. I, was the same I way. have no idea. So I had to ask Linda, what's a mani and a pedi? Yeah. She had to explain it to me. Don't judge me. Okay. <laughs> now, these same folks were asked about not things they enjoy doing, but things that they have to get done. Remember, look up at the things they enjoy doing. Wasn't anything there about God. But now let's talk about the things that they have to get done in their lives. Maybe not enjoy it, but they need to get done. How about the men? Well, the first thing men would say that they have to do that they may not enjoy is to get a job. They have yeah, to work, work at a job. Many men have jobs that require them to work Saturdays. Sundays or weeknights. Other necessities on, on this polling list was honeydew projects indoors like painting 
painting a room, fixing a sink, yeah. paying bills, honeydew chores, or any outdoor type activities like washing a car or fixing a sprinkler. Now for the women, the biggest thing that they may not want to do but they think it's a responsibility is basically household chores. Women are very, very, it's important to them to have a clean home, most women. Household chores like possibly cooking, maybe cleaning. Other things that need to be done by women on weeknights or the weekends may include taking care of children, homework for the children, baths for the children, laundry, vacuuming, and of course picking up after your kids. Do a lot. So I guarantee you that most of you listening here, it affected Donovan and I, especially when we had younger kids, that you would be able to relate to this poll when it comes to things you love to do and then things that you need to do. Well, this, you know what this tells me when I saw this poll? We're very busy. There's a lot of things that's going on in our lives, very, a lot of things that are on our plate. But it also tells me that when we have so many things going on, things we have to do, things we like to do, there's no room for God. And there's no room for God's Word in our busy schedule. If we are going to prioritize God and make godly choices, then we need to separate the things we like to do and need to do and prioritize God's Word, not only reading it, but understanding and meditating on what the verses say. It seems like most people, including Christians, are more concerned about the worldly things that have to get done versus the heavenly things that need to be done. Mm -hmm. Folks, today I'm going to ask all of you. I'm going to ask Donovan, because I've been asking myself also. We need to re readjust our thinking for 2019. Many of these things that are on our have-to-do list uh, will still need to get done. We have to keep working. We still need to take care of our children. And we still need to do honeydews around our house. Those things have to happen. But we need to figure out how to include Bible reading, Bible meditation, especially on things that are important in our lives that we need to make choices on as part of our things-to-do list. And the reason why, again, folks, the timing is now. We're living in the end times. And I'm praying that you all choose godly um, things like putting, teaching, and meditating on the Bible as the top of the things for you to do during your weeks. I want to end this podcast opening remarks with one last verse of encouragement for you to think about and pray about in living for God. I'm praying that it opens up your heart to what I'm talking about today in wanting to learn more about God during your week. It's Colossians 3, verse 1. Colossians 3, verse 1, going through verse 3 in the New Living Testament. It goes like this. Since you have been raised to a new life in Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Listen to this, folks. Think about the things of heaven and not always the things of this earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ, mm. our God. Praise the Lord. Let's yes. pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your encouragement from your word. Lord, you know how important it is to read and meditate on, God, on your word. Our goal, Lord, is to truly learn more about you in order to become a true reflection of you in our lives and, more, and also to make godly choices every day. But Lord, we know that it all starts about knowing you first. Lord, I pray that the heart of everyone listening or watching this podcast is touched by your spirit, and they are motivated and excited to want to learn more from your word. Lord, we love you with all we have and with all we are, and we give you glory and praise in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed this, uh, today's opening monologue on the importance of making timely and godly decisions, utilizing the Bible as your guide especially as we're trying to live a righteous 2019. As I mentioned already, we make so many decisions, and we must make sure that it's grounded in the wisdom of God's Word. Now, next week, we will take a look at the results of these godly, godly and timely decisions and understand more and more what this idea of discipleship is all about. Discipleship is truly righteous living, living for God from His eyes, and a goal that I think we all need to have in 2019. You don't want to miss it as we go further and further into living this righteous life for the Lord. 
Again, I want to thank you so much for, take, uh, for looking at our Reflections Ministries Facebook page. I got, a, I got a report this morning from Facebook saying, congratulations, you're over 3,000 wow. likes. But we're almost at 3,100 follows. So again, God, Facebook is making it difficult for difficult. us to do it. But you know what? It's because you are sharing it. You're liking it, you're commenting on it, and that's what makes a huge difference. So Amen. please continue to do that on the Reflections Ministries Facebook page. And of course, I'm praying that the page is blessing you with the podcasts, with the memes, with the devotionals, and anything else that we put on there that brings us closer to the Lord. Thank you so much for listening to my opening remarks, and God bless you. Amen. Um, it, it, you know, I was listening to some of the things that you mentioned. I had no idea that we like to do nothing. I thought it would be... You know, number one, being a guy, you know, when I was younger, I'm older guy now. But um, I thought number one would be our marital, um, our marital duties in regards to our spouse. Oh, like sex? Yeah, the sex. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, that's yeah. what I would have thought yeah. would be number one. Yeah. <laughs> well, probably that should have been number yeah. one. I don't <laughs> know. But, yeah, but it's, it's so interesting about a nothing box because, uh -huh. you know, I learned a lot about that from a, 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 a show that I watched mm -hmm. that says that men really enjoy doing nothing. And I thought about that, I think. You know, that's really true. If I'm listening to music type thing, my mind's not going 100 miles an hour. I just kind of relax the mind and just like to enjoy the music and that's it. Yeah. Well, that's a nothing box. Yeah. Or when you're watching TV, it's just a show. You're not, you're just, and you're just not thinking about anything. Yeah. That's it, a nothing yeah, box. Yeah, if you've ever been to the zoo, you'll see the gorilla, the male gorilla, uh -huh. like a silverback or something, and he just sits there and does nothing. He just, he just, he just <laughs> himself, you know, which is, you know, which is our closest uh, yeah. primate uh, exactly. to us like that. And then, um. When you're talking about the people, uh, like when your wife is talking to you, like women might like to talk. Mm -hmm. That is where uh, Charles Schultz came up with the wah, 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 yeah, wah. Yeah. Because if you really think about it, That's you know, how it, men it yeah, if you've been with your spouse or your significant other a significant amount of time, you know when to tune them out and then maybe hear key words that are like, say, hey, huh, what did you say? Yeah, it's funny with Linda, my wife, we've been married for many, many years, and it's funny, she will all of a sudden out of the blue bring up something from 10 years ago. Oh, I was just thinking about that. Yeah. Right. Really? Why? What's the, I mean, what what it possibly came into your mind just thinking, oh, I don't know. Some just kind of yeah, popped in. Up. I just want to think about I can't do that, number one, because I don't even remember yesterday, because <laughs> 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. And, and I just, our men's brains usually don't go in that direction. Some men's do, but most men don't. But women can. Right. And they love to talk. Right. And they yeah. like to yeah. share their feelings and understanding. That's great. But for guys, a lot of guys, that's a little tough yeah, at yeah. times. I, I would strongly recommend guys to learn to um, nod your head a lot. <laughs> yeah, don't ever look <laughs> yeah. like you're not paying yeah, attention. That's right. I'll get you in bigger there trouble. You but you know what? Again, when we look at those things, like things we know we have to do and things that we enjoy doing, we got to God's got to be part of that equation. Mm -hmm. Because if we don't make a conscious decision to put God as part of that routine, it'll never happen. And yeah, in 2019, we'll be sitting here in 2020 asking, well, how was your 2019? It's not going to be any different than the last five, ten years. Ten years that's passed in it, your life. It, it goes back to making the choice. Of, no, I want to put God first. I want to learn more about what I want to live more God. Like. Amen. Amen, yeah. So, uh, excellent topic. I, mean, I didn't really think about Yeah, that, it's fun. So. It's so funny. <laughs> well, we're going to go from a fun topic of understanding God's Word and meditating for a righteous life to a little bit more of a difficult topic that we started last week that we're going to complete uh, this week. And we're talking about some sins uh, in the Bible that are, I wouldn't call them controversial, because nothing in the Bible is controversial, but from a worldly standpoint may looked upon as controversial, but yet something that we really need to understand from a Bible point of view. Last week we started looking at this idea of abortion. And the reason why we did that is because uh, we're coming up upon the 46th year in February of the Roe versus Wade federal mandate that said that abortion was legal. Well, last week we talked a little bit about some of the uh, data, some of the facts in regards to abortions, in regards to how many abortions. We have about a million abortions per year. That's just in the United States, but mm. if you look worldwide, it's 56 million abortions per year, about 153,000 per day, which if you think about it, that's mind-boggling. Mind that is like incredible how many abortions there is. You know, we talked a lot about this, uh, the uh, African-American women, three times more the idea of having abortions, let's say, than the Hispanic ladies mm -hmm. or the wh white women. Mm -hmm. We talked a lot about um, 100,000 abortions that were done in the second and third trimester of, 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 of the pregnancy process, which is mind-boggling to me. So 
So after all those facts, and then I gave you a bunch of verses. I gave you verses that basically explained it from God's point of view. What does he see in regards to life? Is life start when the child is born? Well, from God's view, the answer, of course, is no. Based on Jeremiah 1.5, Psalm 139.13, Job 31.15, among many, many others, the Bible is very, very clear that life begins at conception, that conception point. And then God knew us even before we were in the womb of the mom type thing. And God sees life at that point and not at a point at a later time where the world sometimes sees it that way. So what I want to do today is I want to, I want to talk a little bit about a law that uh, was passed uh, recently in uh, the state of New York. And then I want to talk a little bit about the effects of abortion on women, Christian women and non-Christian women. And then I want to end this by asking Donovan four difficult but yet very thought-provoking questions when it comes to abortion. Do you, first of all, Donovan, have you heard about that New York law? Yeah, I heard a little bit about it. I haven't I had the chance to do my, like, like read into it yet. Well, what it is, and I don't know all the details of it. I, I've read some parts of it. it it's, an, it's called the New York Abortion Law. And basically what it does is allow the woman to make the decision to have an abortion post-24 weeks. Right. Well, if you know 24 weeks, if you do your math divided by four, that's six months. That's basically the end of the second trimester. You know, most pregnancies last a full nine months, some a little bit less, some a little bit more. But if they're allowing women to be able to make the decision to have an abortion past the second trimester into the third trimester. And real quick, the fetus is fully formed. Exactly. We're going to talk a little bit about that. You know, the, the where, what exactly is the fetus in that? Now, they do say that the only... The, the main reason for this was based on the, if it's going to affect the health of the mom. If it's going to affect the health of the mom, then it becomes part of this statute or put, becomes part of this law. Also, they say that um, it only affects, you know, if it's going to have a problem with the child. If they see that it's going, if the child's not going to be viable. Let's say that the child is ill or something, or they find something with the child. Some sort of a chromosome gene that says the child will not last. You know, there's a lot of uh, sure. there's a lot of diseases out there that the child basically dies in, in, the womb. in the womb. Exactly. So they said those are except. But the problem with it is that when you stretch out this law, you can almost make any excuse it. Yeah. You can to be able to say yes, I don't want a child. Because the question I was going to ask you, well, what happens if they find out in the third trimester that that child's going to have Down syndrome, that that child's going to have mental. Um, deficiencies that child is going to be disabled in one way or the other can well, that be part of this law absolutely. in the third trimester absolutely well what if they find out that it's a black child what if they find out it has blue eyes what if they find out that it's a girl you mm -hmm. know i mean yeah and I, I i say that not to be like a racial or anything but i'm just saying these things that might happen if i'm a daughter and my dad doesn't really like you know and i have with the black guy well i gotta get rid of the baby because i'm scared of my parents exactly um, so though so from the law standpoint those now become potential viable reasons to have an abortion post 24 weeks, right. post, in like in the third trimester. Well, like Donovan already said, what is the form of that fetus in the third trimester? It's fully formed. It is fully formed. It is, uh, it is basically getting nourished by the mom. Mm -hmm. It has got a heartbeat. It's got its ma my major organs already pretty much um, built, um, built, built, built within them. So you're basically saying that it's the mom's right to choose after the second trimester in order to have an abortion if it doesn't fit you know basically what they believe is what the type of child or what they want in regards to a um uh in regards to a son or daughter and it just when you think about that it's almost alarming mm -hmm. and it's like what would god think of something like that i mean is that that law is telling me again going back to understanding the times this has got to be the end time be. because there's no way that anybody could think of killing a child in the third trimester has got to be right. Right, right, exactly. I, you, and I, I yeah. know you agree with that. Oh, yeah, no, I, wholeheartedly. I mean, at that point, it's like, okay, what, what, what's going to be is going to be. Yeah, I agree. With, yeah, and this leads me to my next question. And, and, and I'm not going to get to the four questions yet, but I want to ask Donovan what he thinks. What do you think, and I want to talk both unbelievers and believers, what do you think the effects on women that have an abortion 20 years later, what do you think the effects on those women are after they have experienced abortion later on in life? I have no doubt within my soul that um, it's almost like a PTSD syndrome. They have a, uh, a regret and a remorse because, you know, that's, that was a life 
that that was inside them and they knew that. Now I'm a man, I know as people say, well, how can you talk? That's true. But, but no, what I'm understand. saying as, as somebody, as a soldier, when you've taken a life out there, I don't care how hard of a Rambo soldier you think you are, you think about each and every one of those kills. You know, he's, a, he's absolutely right. You know, in a, in a, um, I got some data here, very, very loose data. I'm not, they're not very, it's not very specific. But what this data says that over 50%, over 50% of women that had an abortion in their past, 20 years later, will feel, 20 years later, one or more of these type of emotions. Regret, mm -hmm. anger, guilt, shame, sense of loneliness, loss of self-confidence, insomnia, nightmares, relationship issues, suicidal thoughts, eating disorders, and depression. Over 50%. Say they, a lot of people say, well, no, abortion doesn't affect women. You know, they just have their abortion and go on with their lives. That's not true. Emotionally and mentally, it does affect women. Right, and you right there describe the symptoms of PTSD. That's exactly right. That is exactly <laughs> what it is. Now, you might be thinking, oh, yeah, that only affects Bible thumpers. It only reflects Bible. Let me give you a little statistics on that. When it came to believers, the effects of one of those uh, symptoms to a woman 20 years later, it was over 80% mm. for believers. But for unbelievers, women that have not ever accepted Christ as the Lord said, it's still over 40% of women that feel the loss of that, you know, that child that was uh, within them, they still feel it 20 years later. Here's a statistic you haven't brought up, and nobody really brings it up. The fathers of those child, where that decision was made without him being consulted or whatever, you know. So hypothetically, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in the world. I have a girlfriend. She tells me she's pregnant. I tell her, hey, we're not ready or whatever we're doing. You know, I don't know what her decision is. She goes out and does what she does, or you know, without consulting me, I find out later. Mm -hmm. The regret that the men go through at the point that they yeah. lost each other. Yeah, it's both. It's it's, yeah. it's literally both of them. That's why God says abortion is wrong. That's why the Bible says that conception, that life begins at conception, because God knows. God knows the effect not only the, to, the, to the unborn fetus, number one, but also the effect of the men and women that are basically going through that process. God knows. That's why he says abortion's a sin. Now, that leads me to four very interesting, and I'm kind of putting Donovan on the spot a little bit, but very interesting but very difficult questions to think about when it comes to abortion. Let me give you the first one. All right. And think about this, Donovan. Number one, can you be a pro-choice individual and still be a Christian? Yes. Okay. Can you expand on what, why you, what you think? Um, you know, and when I say that, it, I'm very narrow, as I say it, because, because I'm, I'm a pro-choice, or, 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 or let's say I'm, pro, I'm pro-life. I don't believe in uh, death at any, any bearing. If somebody kills somebody, they should go to life in prison, let God decide when the day has come. Um, but that this... Uh, God knows our heart, and he's going to, if you're remorseful and you want to ask for forgiveness, he's going to forgive us. So that's my stance on that. Very, that's, that, that and, he, and Donovan, the answer to the question, can you be pro-choice, still be a Christian, the answer is absolutely yes. There's only way that you cannot be a Christian, and that's when you don't accept Jesus Christ right. as your Lord and Savior. If the Holy Spirit comes knocking, and God is basically right. drawn into you, and you accept him as your Savior, then yes, you are a Christian, even if, you had an abortion in your past, or even if you have an abortion going forward. So yes, you can be a pro-choice and still be a Christian. But there's a couple of things I need to warn you about this. If you look at 2 Corinthians 5.17, it, it, it makes it clear that when we accept Christ, we become a new creation. Yes. When you become a new creation, new creation means the old way you're thinking, this gone. change is gone, and now you think differently because God trans changes the way we think. So normally when we were talking about some of the effects on, on, um, on abortion to uh, men or women, you know, 20 years later, the reason they have those, um, uh, 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 those different thoughts and th those different problems is because they've been transformed. transformed. Realizing now what they did was not what God would want, want them, them to do. do. But are they still a Christian? Yes, oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Are they still going to heaven? Absolutely. absolutely. Yes, all they need to do is confess their sin. There is no sin that you cannot confess. But if you are a born-again believer, you, the Holy Spirit, let me give you another verse, and, and I think about 1 Corinthians 6, 19 when it comes to mm. this, um, this question, because, you know, when God basically, when Jesus died on the cross for our sins and we surrendered to Him, our bodies basically become, belong to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And that's what 1 Corinthians 6, 19 yeah. talks about. 
So basically, our, our lives are not our own. It belongs to God type thing. So when we make a decision against God's, God's word, you know, and if that affects our bodies, which is what a pro-choice uh, stance is all about, then is that basically a biblical stance? Well, the answer, of course, is no. It's not. But that, again, that doesn't affect the fact if you're a Christian. So I want to make that crystal clear. It's a sin in the eyes of God, but it doesn't affect your salvation in one way or the other. But one of the things that you need to realize is once you become a Christian, then Romans 12, 1 and 2 takes effect. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says basically you got to, your mind and heart gets transformed to the Word of God. How does your mind and heart get transformed to the Word of God? You've got the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. How can it not? Before, when you're living in the world, it's all about your sinful nature. When you get a, become a born-again believer, now your life has been transformed by the will of God. So, of course, your mind and heart is going to think differently than it did before, and that includes abortion. And that includes, includes your pro-choice stance because you start seeing things from God's eyes rather than your own. So, the answer to the question, pro-choice is still be a Christian? The answer is absolutely yes. However, once you become a born-again Christian and you start living your life for God, I can see that pro-choice understanding probably would be changed. Second question for you, Donovan. This one's a tough one, too. Is there a difference between abortion and a woman's right to choose? Between a, that's tough. Yes. I would have to say yes. There's what is difference the difference? Between abortion and a woman's right to choose? Um, well, the woman's right to choose is uh, either I'm going to do it or I'm not going to do it, where abortion is you're doing it. Let me ask you a question another way. Is, is, it, is it fair to say that you um, hate a, you hate rape, but you support a man's right to do it? Mm. God, that's tough. I, I, I couldn't give you. I, 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 that's, I gotta think about that. See I, the reason, and that, and, 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 and that's yeah. I I didn't want to put Donovan on the spot because that's not even fair. Right. We don't prep these questions yeah, right. beforehand. Yeah. But if you think about it, the reason why most people sell the idea of Roe versus Wade is because they say it's a woman's body, it's a woman's right to mm -hmm. choose. So they're basically using the term right to choose as an acceptance of abortion. abortion. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is still the same. It's still against God's word. Sure. If you call it right to choose and you call it abortion, basically it's the same thing. Same thing. It's the same thing. You're choosing. Yeah, a woman does have a right to choose. It is your body. But you also have standards in the Bible that you, it, that you need to follow, basically in regard to what God teaches in, in, yes. in, in regards to your, your body, because our body's not our own. So our body belongs mm. to God. So you've got to allow God to lead you when it comes to your rights to choose. Because it goes back to the same thing. What's the rights of the child? He doesn't have any rights because the woman has the right to do away with that fe uh, child or not do away with it. But, so, but where, 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 where's the father's rights in that too? Yeah, I'm only looking from the mom's point of okay, view. Right, and you're right. right and yeah. you're right. The father should have rights. rights and so I agree with that. And the law I'm, doesn't give us any rights. Oh, no, there's, that's very true. <laughs> but again, with most, a lot of times when, the, when abortion decisions are made, and you, and a lot of times it's done just with the woman. Mm -hmm. And that's sad because men you know, go their different direction. But in regards to a woman's right to choose an abortion, they're the same thing. There really is. You're just packaging it in a way that makes it look acceptable. Mm -hmm. But in, from God's eyes, again, this is a Good Bible point. thing looking Good at. Point. It's God's. In God's eyes, it's the same. Third question. And this is one, a question I've asked so many people that are pro-choice. And I've never really got an answer that I really understood. So I want to ask Don. I know he's not pro-choice. Yeah. In a pro-choice, what I call pro-abortion view, when does the fetus turn into a child? Like is it magical? Wow. That's from a pro-choice point a... of view. Obviously, when they say you're doing an abortion, you're not killing a child. Oh, no, 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 you're killing yeah. a fetus. Well, when does that fetus become a child? Is it when they take their first breath in, on earth? Right. So and what, it was like out. a magic trick that yeah. for nine months they were never a child, but now they're, they're born and they're a child. Is that how that works? Right. What would you, if someone asked you that question, Don, what would you think? What, what's the well, first thoughts that come to your you mind? Know, scientifically, I would say after the, you know, it forms after the second trimester, you know, when it's fully formed. That's it has a heartbeat? Say, yeah, well, I would say when it's formed. Heart, mm -hmm. You know, heartbeat could be Now, this is from a pro-choice point of view. Right. Because right. pro-life is that conception. Yeah. But from a pro-choice, right. so yeah. you would think second. when you hear a heartbeat and that the bar and the fetus is form. formed, mm -hmm. you would think that that's a life. Right. So why do pro-choice individuals or people do not still support the second and third trimester of abortion? That's, that's a good question. That, and, you know, it's funny. That's I've asked many pro-choice um, individuals, women and women. It's not just all women. Men and mm -hmm. women. They don't have an answer. The answer is when they took their they take their first breath because that's what supposedly what the law says. I'm not asking what the law says. I'm asking an individual when is that when does that fetus become a child or an infant or a baby, whatever word you want to use, 
in regards to a pro-choice view. Now, from a pro-life view, that's a simple. Yeah. Biblically, it's very simple. It's at conception. Yeah. From a pro-choice view, they say when the child takes it's its first breath on life. Right. Really? Yeah, then I the question I have, then the follow-up is, well, then in the mother's womb, when does that magic happen that it becomes a fetus that has basically no life mm -hmm. to a life after first breath on, on this earth? And there's no answer to yeah. that. Yeah. And that's the problem with pro-choice. Wow. I understand women's right to choose and all that, but the bottom line is that's why God made this very simple. Very simple. Life begins at conception. No other doubts about that. And God it treasures every life in the mother's womb. Mm. Doesn't matter if it had any disabilities or whatever. Yes, there's going to be times when there's complications that could affect the mother's life, but that doesn't. But the child is not. A, you know, what's the word I use? The child's not to blame right. for those things. That's part of. That's it's part not of the life. It's exactly. It's part of life, and that, and that's just you know unfortunate, ah. but it's part of life. Okay, last question for you, mm -hmm. and this one's always thought was really interesting. If a person murders a pregnant woman, is it considered a double homicide? Yes. Oh, whoa, okay, now, now I'm a little confused. <laughs> yes. If it's not a person in regard to pro-choice, then how come when a man or a woman murders a pregnant woman, it becomes a double homicide? Explain that to me. That's a good question because in most states, if you do that, it's on the books, even on the federal statute. It is on the book that's a, considered a double homicide. I, I, I don't understand. But that. even though the Supreme Court said that it's not, it's a... a so... It sounds so, like an enigma. So yeah. is it a life or is it not a life? It's a life. It's is it a life for a woman's right to choose? But it, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's a non-life and a woman's right to choose, but it is a life in a double homicide. And, and a homicide. That's, that's what they say. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> that's what they well, say. Well, let me tell you what the law is. The law basically, from a federal statute point mm -hmm. of view, there is no law when it comes to a person murdering a pregnant woman. Mm -hmm. However, in 38 states, including California, mm -hmm. It is a double. double murder when you kill a pregnant yes. woman. In 23 states, it is a double murder at any point of the pregnancy. It could be she could be pregnant one day, right. and if you kill that woman that's pregnant for one day or one week when she realizes she's pregnant, that's a double yeah, homicide. Right now, I know some listeners are going to say, "Well, how can they uh, find out if the woman is pregnant in it for one day?" But, yeah. DNA. That, the it's DNA is advanced. Yeah, that's yeah, what's way too yeah. easy. DNA can so, so the question you need to ask yourself if it's a if it's considered a double homicide, then why is it not considered a homicide in regards to killing the baby in its womb? What's the difference? Uh, you know, uh, playing devil's advocate, I would think that what it is is they don't want to lock up all these women that mm -hmm. are faced with that situation. No, and you know it's funny. And, and our goal here is yeah. not to lock up anybody yeah, but, type thing. It's just the hypocrisy of what yes, the way we exactly. see. A woman, a, a child in the womb. That is a good. I'm gonna start using that. That's, yeah, that's it's a, a thing it's to think it's about. a hypocrisy in seeing that because in in my eyes, that all these questions make no sense because life begins at conception. End the story. Go on to the next topic. Mm -hmm. But in regards to the world and how they see it, you know, you start coming in with all these you know unanswered questions and and a little bit of this conflict that there's no answers for. It's and and I, I it's funny. I've talked. I've been in these blogs of women's groups about a woman who's pregnant and, and, uh, and it's considered a double homicide and they are vehement about making sure that that uh, perpetrator right. gets, you know, gets a double murder him, because right. you know better than I do, Donovan, if you got a double murder, you're going to get a lot more time than if you just killed one person. Yes. I mean, you go from right. 25 to life to possibly death penalty. Right. A big difference. And yeah, these women are, these pro-choice women say, yes, you know, give them yeah. double murder. Mm -hmm. I don't understand the difference. So, but, so it's, a, it's a life when it's convenient, but it's not a life when it's not convenient. Well, that's not the way God's word works. It's the same consistently all the way through. And that's why I, I believe it's really important to understand, understanding what abortion is from God's view. Again, I'm going to make this so clear that if you've had an abortion in your past, it is not the unforgivable sin. If you've had an abortion or multiple abortions in your past, you have, not, you have not done that. All yeah. you need to do is ask God for forgiveness. forgiveness. God will forgive, forgive you. you because he took every sin, past, present, and future, to the cross to an un, to a, a born-again believer. But in regards to understanding it from God's view, we need to be crystal clear. God teaches vehemently that life begins at conception. Yes, you know, uh, the funny thing is, and for those that are listening out there, um, the first question you asked about uh, pro-life versus pro-choice, whatever the mm -hmm. thing is, 
I never really thought about that because we, uh, you had talked about that last year, mm -hmm. and, and it made me think about that, and that's how I was able to answer that, that question very good. So, again, thank you for teaching you know, me as well as other people that might not have gotten it. Right. You know, what that stance really would be because I'm telling you, uh, prayer and uh, study, the Bible works. And I, I said, it does. And, and I'm going to tell you, thank you for what you're doing now because if I can get it, and I'm, I'm basically a dullard, my faith in Christ has, has grown expo exponentially since we've been doing this show. Oh, praise God. I've heard a lot of people say the exact same thing, Donovan, so I appreciate mm -hmm. that. One more thing I want to add in regard to abortion that sure. I want to make sure it's crystal clear in the minds of Donovan and the viewers is the fact that when we're talking about abortion here, we're not talking about mi miscarriage. Right. Miscarriage is based on a, on, on, on a, on a process that yeah. is uh, under no control right. of the mom or the doctor yeah. or anybody else. In other words, it's, a, it, it's a victimless that, yeah. type of uh, situation. It is... I've known so many women that's gone Lost. through miscarriages, yeah. and I, oh my gosh, my heart breaks, breaks yeah. for these women that, that's had to go through that because that's a victimless crime, and there's, yeah. there's nothing that could have been done. That, so people ask me, is a miscarriage a no, sin? absolutely of not. Of course not. Absolutely it not. is not a sin because it's not in any, in, in, under anybody's control that, it ha that things happen like that. People die. Uh, children die in the womb, uh, sure. which is unfortunate, and things happen. And so, health-wise for the mother, sometimes some exactly. women can't carry exactly. for medical. Yeah, medical. so we're not talking about miscarriages or anything else like that or any other situation. We're basically talking about the firm understanding of pro-choice, the idea of an abortion in either first, second, or third trimester against what God teaches in His Word. Yeah, and um, another thing is, uh, I, I was raised on the model of God will never give you no more of a burden than what you can carry. No, there's no question. Yeah, God will, yeah, yeah. First Corinthians 10, 13 talks about temptation, mm -hmm. and that God will never give you more than you can, you know, pretty much what temptation yeah. more than you can handle. I'm a firm believer of that, that God, He will equip you with any situation. Because I've always thought about that. Let my wife ask me that question. If our one of our two children um, was born with, um, let's say, muscular dystrophy right, or a, any other type of disease, mm -hmm. uh, could I have handled it? I look at that and says yes, it would be. I, I would look at that and say it would be tough. Yeah, because my patience is low. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be in my own strength. I'd say the answer is completely zero. No, right. I couldn't. Mm -hmm. But in God's strength. I would. That's what you're talking about. He'll never give us more. He will strengthen us. It will be God that allows me to be able to, you know, I would love that child, you know, you know, you know, unconditionally type thing. And when, but, it, you know, first glance, I'd say, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? Sure, of course. But when God, you know, you knowing that God will be the one that strengthens, you know, does, does basically everything we need in order to be able to, you know, do, raise that child. Yeah, the answer is yes. I would be not well, an issue because of God. Well, what's to me, you know, that, and, and that's the whole thing. Everybody, they're... And I'm not saying everybody doesn't have faith, but put it in God's hands exactly. and believe it. Exactly. And believe it. I'm you, can you, you can accomplish all yes. things through Christ who gives you strength. That's why Philippians 4.13 is one of the most popular verses in the Bible because it's so true. Anything that you don't think you can handle, put it in God's hands. Okay. And you can. We only got a couple seconds here left. I just want to again thank you so much for checking out Reflections Ministry Facebook page. I want to talk a little, for about a minute here about my book, uh, Reaching New Heights. Uh, we're starting a brand new campaign. And the campaign is going to, it's already on the website, reachingnewheightsbooks.com. What is called, it's campaign, it's called Ask the Pastor. See, here's a lot of things that people have asked. They've asked me that, you know, in regard to the book, there's 365 topics. But for most people, they may only be struggling with one, or maybe one or two, or they have friends. So that, I have a section there called Ask the Pastor. So what you could do is, you just type in, go into the website, and you email me, all anonymous, and it, it's very anonymous, you email me the issue that your middle school or young high school uh, uh, youth is going through, and then what I do is I will answer that and then reference a page in the book so that you can see exactly how God sees the issue. I've already had questions on loneliness, rejection by friends, peer pressure. Peer pressure. I've already had a few questions like that, but it's allowing you to utilize you know, my research on all these issues for middle school kids, and then I'll give you a little bit more of an understanding what the book is all about. So... If you have a middle school child or you have a young high school and you've got issues, go to www.reachingnewheightsbooks.com. Scroll down to the bottom. You'll see an Ask the Pastor. I will answer each one of them myself and help you through the situation that your child is going through. And then you'll get a better understanding of what the books are all about. So remember, Ask the Pastor. You'll enjoy it. We're out of time. God bless you for, uh, for being with us today. I hope you enjoyed it. And again, next week will be on Wednesday. I haven't even told that to Don. I've got a colonoscopy on Tuesday. Oh, that's right. That's right. Oh, gosh. That. I'd rather...
Never mind. Yes. Anyways, it'll be next Wednesday. God bless you. We'll see you guys again next week. Pastor Don Weekly Devotional.